Hey guys, I'm Sam, that's the Sun Eater, and this is a YouTube channel where we look at using onboard solar and auxiliary batteries to extend the lifespan of an old EV. Today's episode is going to be about what an onboard charging station would look like if it didn't have the solar panels attached to it. But before we dive into that, I want to give you guys a quick update on how the car is doing. Uh, we've got 2,000 miles on it since we added the portable solar charging station. If you remember at the end of the last episode, the roof rack episode, um, I was having a problem with the solar panels drooping down. I tried to just space out those little roof rack anchors enough to keep tension on that panel, uh, to keep it from drooping, but it just didn't work. So what I wound up going up and uh, going back and doing is building this little H-frame out of aluminum 90s. These solar panels come with grommets in them so you can fit the bolts through there at all four corners and it stays very secure. And underneath of those aluminum 90s, I've just got one flat crossbar to go across and add a little more support. That white tape right there that helps keep the panel attached to the frame uh, is the leftover a turnabond tape that I had left over from uh, attaching the panels on the roof of the vehicle to there. Uh, and it's a lot more secure now. I can drive down the freeway at 65 miles an hour without them flapping all over the place in the wind. And I will see if I can get an Uber that'll let my wife ride in the passenger seat and get a little bit of footage of this thing zipping down the freeway at 65 miles an hour and you guys can get a better feeling for how secure that roof rack is at those high speeds. Alright, what speed are we going? 60. We're going 60 right now? 60, 60. That's wonderful. All right, I think we got the shot. Thanks, Gabe, for helping me out. Take care of your Uber drivers, folks. I had to use the 90 instead of a flat bar of aluminum because a flat bar, even when it's got a pretty good thickness to it, just doesn't really offer any resistance to bending. If you attach a solar panel to this, you're still getting a lot of drooping even though it's a thick bar. But, if you run the thin little 90 down both edges of that, it stays very rigid, offers a lot of resistance to bending, and so it's pretty dang weightless, and it'll give you real good structural stability for that roof rack. Okay, so that's it for what we'll call the uh, speed test, I guess. We only got it up to 65, but really, this isn't the kind of setup that you're gonna be driving 90 miles an hour down the freeway. We're not trying to build a race car here. We're building the cheapest commuter vehicle possible and giving people just the the cheapest option you can possibly get to and from work. That's what this system's about. So that's, and 65 miles is perfectly acceptable for that application. Okay, now jumping into the meat of the video. Can we build a onboard vehicle charging system that doesn't have solar panels or a charge controller why would we do that and what would it look like? Well, I got thinking about this when I watched a video from another big EV YouTube channel called Transport Evolved. They're uh, more professional, I guess you would say, than this one. Uh, 100,000 subscribers. They do uh, actual like studio video editing. It's not some dude in his driveway with a camera. Um, but they were describing... They, they both drive electric vehicles. And... One of the, the people on the channel had a, Kate had a old leaf like mine, and I was blown away by the number of similarities between her situation and mine. They both chose to live out in the country, um, which gave them a 50 mile commute, and they did not have charging stations available to them where they worked. So that's, 
exactly my situation. And they, they had, did an episode on their channel last week about how in the winter um, with the range loss, because cold batteries don't have as much capacity as hot batteries, um, they just couldn't quite make that round trip commute anymore. Uh, with their old leaf. If they could add just 10 or 15 miles onto it, it, they'd be comfortable with it, they'd love to keep driving it, and it would erase all that range anxiety. Kate even says on the video that if she could get a new battery pack in her leaf for $4,000, that she would do that in a heartbeat and continue to drive the vehicle. And that got me thinking. Solar, the, the further north from the equator you go, the fewer hours of sunlight a day you get, the less effective solar becomes. Also, if you live in like Portland, Oregon, it's really hilly and there's tall trees everywhere. Solar's not gonna be quite as effective there as well. But can, could she build a portable EV charging station in her leaf? And could she do it at the price point she was looking at, which was around $4,000? Uh, and what would that system look like without any solar panels or charge control or anything else attached to it, just the batteries and the inverter? So. I, I got to thinking about it and I'm like, okay, let's, let's compare uh, the costs of, of the option they wound up going with. Because after they posted the, the video, I'm like, oh man, this is, I know how to solve this problem. I'm going to email them and we're going to uh, fix their range problem or add, you know, 15, 20 miles onto a day and be good. And the next day they, they posted a video about going out and buying their new Chevy Volt. And I'm like, ah, there goes my opportunity to, uh, to help them fix that problem with an onboard charging station. But let's look at the option that they wound up going with and how much that cost and what their cost per miles will be with their Chevy Volt. And we'll look at, we'll mock up a system. I'm gonna go with a 24 volt, 10 kilowatt portable EV charging station and see what it would cost to build one of those in an old leaf. And we'll compare the cost per mile of, of that hypothetical system with the cost per mile of the Chevy Volt that they went with, and we'll see if the how the how the the numbers work out, what their effective cost per mile would be in both cases, and uh, if a portable onboard EV charging station would have been a good fix for them uh, hypothetically. Okay, so Kate has driven her Leaf for a hundred thousand miles, and it's degraded from seventy-three miles to fifty-one miles. Of maximum range so she's been treating her battery pretty nice she hasn't been running it all the way to empty she hadn't been hooking it up to the supercharger she's gotten a pretty good mileage out of it for a leaf battery so far that's 22 miles of lost range so if the range loss continues at this rate we can expect to see a remaining range of about 30 miles when the odometer hits 175,000 miles you're gonna lose range a little faster toward the end because you're having to cycle the battery more. Um, you're, you're draining your battery pretty much, you're running your battery through a full cycle every day uh, when you get to the end of it, as opposed to only about 60% of a cycle when you first get the leaf. So it's gonna, your range is gonna fall off a little faster toward the end. So we need to build a system for Kate that will add at least 25 miles to the leaf's maximum range. And that system, based on the, the fuel economy that the leaf gets, is gonna be a six or seven kilowatt hour battery system so what's the best price that we can get on a auxiliary battery system that's going to add this range to her leaf if I were trying to build a system that has these specifications to solve this problem I would use two test uh, 5.2 kilowatt hour Tesla battery packs those cost 1000 I think 25 or 50 dollars a piece so the total for the two batteries is going to be around 2,050 or 2,100. I would use a uh, 24 volt. The two batteries are going to be run in parallel. And you will use a 24 volt lithium ion battery charger so that you can charge not only your, you'll plug your leaf in when you get to the house like you always do, but you'll also plug in your bet your 24 volt lithium ion battery charger and that will charge up your backup batteries i actually use something very similar i use a 12 volt 
version. I don't know if I'll be able to get a real good shot of it. I've got it strapped in to the underside of this rack and you plug in, see if I get the camera down there, there we go. You plug in your battery charger and that puts about, when you get home, you know, 700 watts into your battery bank and that charges up your backup battery bank so it's fully charged when you get to work the next day and you can plug your car into your 24 volt inverter and when I charge my backup batteries at home they're actually charging off the the home solar so it's uh, the car gets solar power pretty much no matter where it is it's just convenient for me to have it on the roof so I can charge it at work So we've got our two batteries for 2100. We've got our battery charger, our 24 volt battery charger. That's going to run around 360. And our 24 volt uh, Guyandel inverter. I'd recommend that because I've just had so much success with the one I've been using. And that brings the total expense of this system to about $2,800. We'll, we'll, you know, we'll round up to three grand for. Uh, the wiring and other stuff you'll have to buy to connect it all. I'd probably use the exact same kind of shelving in that system that I've used in mine. Those battery packs, the Tesla ones, are only about, I think, four or five inches tall. So you would be able to fit on, the, on a three-tiered wire rack, two battery modules, and on the very top shelf I would have the inverter and the charger. And that's, they're about 27 inches long, so that'll come over to about here. And you still get about 10 to 12 inches of usable trunk space back here. And you would be able to pull about, I'm going to say at least 8 kilowatt hours out of that system. 8 kilowatt hours, when you put it into a leaf, is going to turn into about 35 miles of added range. So, Kate's got a leaf that does about 50 miles. When she gets to work, she's got about 25 miles left on the odometer. She plugs her car charger into her inverter, all 8 kilowatts go out of those lithium batteries into her main car battery and she adds the 35 miles to the 25 and now she's got 60 miles of additional range again. Essentially the car is fully charged. I think her leaf only holds a maximum of about 60 miles. So she's going back pretty much to a full charge while she's at work and she gets the additional benefit of all the heat that would be put out by the inverter while it's taking the charge out of those batteries and putting it into the car during the day, that's going to generate five to 600 BTUs an hour of heat, and that will heat up the interior of her car during the winter. Okay, so how, what are the, the, what's the cost comparison of these two systems? What, what's the cost per mile that we're looking at going with adding a portable charging system to the LEAF versus just buying a used Chevy Bolt? Let's start out looking at the LEAF. The whole system's going to be under $3,000. I believe you could get another 100,000 miles on the LEAF, assuming a consistent rate of battery degradation, before the range no longer gets Kate to work reliably. And the total cost per mile, $3,000 over 100,000 miles, is going to be around three cents per mile. And that assumes that you throw away your portable EV charging station after you get done using it. Obviously, you wouldn't do that. I think you can sell that system after you've used it for a couple years. Uh, three or four years and probably recoup seven, I'd say at least two three hundred dollars worth of that investment so three cents per mile is what you're getting for another hundred thousand drivable miles using the portable charging station now let's go back and look at the Chevy Volt I think they said they paid around 15 grand for it um, they got it I'm guessing with around 50,000 on the odometer um, and, and they're good cars they you can glad get a quarter of a million miles on a Chevy Volt probably without really having to do any expensive repairs your battery and your motors are gonna last that long they're solid vehicles so her cost per mile is gonna be fifteen thousand dollars over about two hundred thousand additional miles bringing her total cost per mile to about seven point five cents so we can see if we're just looking for the best economy we can possibly get driving that adding a portable charging station and Getting the last few years of life out of that leaf 
is going to come out to under half the cost of getting the new bolt. And unless you've got $15,000 you can drop, just cut a check for it, you're going to wind up paying insurance, uh, title costs to the dealership, all that. Um, so that 15 grand figure is probably going to go up. And this comparison is going to lean in favor of the portable charging station even more. Now at this point, let me recognize that convenience has value. Getting home and plugging in the extension cord, um, plugging your car into the, the backup batteries in the back, you know, that adds an extra every time you're parking, probably 60 seconds to your park. Additionally, that leaf, her old leaf, will still never be able to go over 60, um, 60 miles, even with the portable EV charging station, without her having to stop and charge it. Whereas the Chevy Volt, she can drive 130 miles without having to charge it. So really, these portable EV charging stations work best. They really shine and save you a lot of money when you're building just a commuter vehicle. Um, you can, especially if you drive a fuel inefficient vehicle, you can make your money back very quickly because these systems are just so cheap to build. They're cheap to build, the cars, the, the rundown on Leafs are dirt cheap. So where these systems really shine is just building a A to B commuter vehicle, especially if your alternative or what you're driving now is very fuel inefficient and you're spending a ton on gasoline. You recoup your investments for these portable EV charging systems quite quickly and you know two years or so just because it's they're the, the parts and the cars are cheap relative to your gas bill for the fuel and efficient vehicle that you may be driving which can easily come up to two thousand five hundred dollars a year okay so i hope that helps you understand uh some applications of a portable ev charging station in which you solar would not be a real cost effective option for you um, how you would go about building a portable EV charging station without solar, uh, what it would cost, and what some of the components you need to consider are. So, what's the next step for the Sun Eater? Um, you guys know that I've been looking for a while for a way to fill in all these patches around the large pre-made cells with some of our smaller homemade assemblies. I've got... I've got my hands on some solar cell encapsulant. It is designed to it's designed to encase these cells, protect them from the elements, and um, be a flexible rubber-like material at the same time. A lot of people on my last video suggested uh, marine grade epoxy, and I've reached out to several companies. Um, nobody's really interested in testing out their product on whether or not it works for that application. <laughs> they all give me uh, varying forms of the answer no, that won't work. Anything from the epoxy will melt uh, to, to the epoxy won't bond to the silicone encapsulant. Um, I've talked to some people that manufacture solar cells and they say that if you encapsulate the cell directly in a marine grade epoxy so if we just painted down a layer of epoxy then put the cell on top of that then another layer of epoxy that the solar cell expands when it gets hot but the epoxy does not so over time this kind of forced expansion of the cell in a space that isn't expanding will cause little cracks in it and compromise the function of the cell over time but it's all anecdotal i don't know of anybody that's actually done that experiment over time and see how it turns out or how your functionality of your solar cell falls off so what I think I'm gonna do is go to a junkyard, uh, get an old hood off a car, and try several different methods. Try encasing the cell directly in epoxy, try using a uh, silicone encapsulant, maybe with a layer of hard epoxy over it. We don't want to encapsulate the cell just in this because when the silicone encapsulant dries, it's got a kind of rubbery surface texture and dirt and grit and mud is going to get on there and trying to clean that surface trying to clean the dirt off that kind of rubbery surface is not going to be possible so you need a hard smooth layer to go over your silicone encapsulant so 
I don't know. I'm going to try several different methods. Um, we'll try painting over the encapsulant with a layer of hard epoxy and just see what happens, even though they told us it wouldn't work. And we'll try encasing the cells directly in epoxy and just see what happens. I'll try three different methods of attaching them to a car hood. I'll leave the hood in the sun where those cells will bake for a couple months. And we'll see which treatments hold up the best over time. And that'll really help us learn a lot and what the best way to fill in all these little spaces with our own custom homemade solar panels will be in a method that's easy to do, easy to clean, that'll last. I've had several companies tell me that uh, it's not going to work, um, which is fine. I think basically these companies, unless you email them and say, I need a product to do X and X is exactly what they made the product for, they're not interested in helping you out. They've lost their desire to do cool new things with their product. And at this point, all they want to do is sell it for the same old boring use that it's always been used for. Uh, Trip Light, the company that makes the AC unit that I put in the back of the Sun Eater, sw swore to me that it would not work in that application because the AC unit is designed to be used only in a space that's already cooled. If you put it in a compartment that is hot, they said, the compressor will heat up too quickly and it'll shut the unit off. And I tried to explain to them it's only eight cubic feet. The compressor is going to cool down the ambient air that it is in before the compressor gets hot enough to trip that heat cutoff switch and, and shut the compressor down. They still told me it wouldn't work. I didn't believe them, so I put it in there. And lo and behold, it works great. So a lot of times you just can't trust these companies to give you honest help about whether or not their product will work for your application. If your application isn't exactly what they intended their product for, they're just gonna say no and not mess with it. So that's why we're gonna try two or three different encapsulation methods on the hood and see which one works best. Um, that's all I got for today. Thank you guys for watching. Let's go to the economy V of the week section. And it actually ties in real nicely to the subject matter today of you know, when Kate said, if I could find a new leaf battery for $4,000, then I would do it. Um, and lo and behold, look what the internet found for us. This is a 24 kilowatt generation one original Nissan Leaf battery pack from a vehicle that only had about uh, 10,000 miles on it when it was totaled out. Um, the battery was not damaged though, and the entrepreneur that is selling this on Craigslist was able to pick it up from an auction and I, I, it must have been just a dirt cheap price if he's able to sell it for three thousand and make a profit. Uh, I called him, got a hold of him, and talked to him on the phone, and he's willing to do the the battery exchange for that three thousand dollar price tag um, if you let him keep the old battery. Well, what do you want the old battery for? Uh, watch my last video: amazing things people do with Nissan Leaf batteries to find out the answer to that question. Um, but basically, what this what this deal gives you is that the drivetrain, the motors on your on your Nissan Leaf are gonna are in pretty much yeah on the Nissan Leaf are gonna last way longer than the battery. So your your motor is still good at a hundred thousand, hundred fifty thousand miles. It's still great. So by paying this three thousand dollars and switching out these battery packs, you would basically be rolling your odometer back to ten thousand miles. So you can reset your odometer on your vehicle at 10,000 miles of wear on that battery. For only three grand, you're basically getting a new car. That's a pretty good deal. Okay, the second economy V of the week is a 2013 red Nissan Leaf that my wife found on uh, Nissan Leaf Owners USA forum. It's got 50,000 miles on it. Uh, it's got a brand new battery, 11 out of 12 bars. That gives you about 70 miles of... Uh, range out of, out of it even on the freeway um, it is located in Enid Oklahoma it comes with new tires uh, a couple of charge controllers and it's going for 4900 bucks um, this car will last you at least another hundred thousand miles at least um, 150 if you treat it right uh, you're not going to be able to touch that price or come anywhere near it in any really any any gas car at all um, even the little smart car is gonna run you more than that when you figure in gas and oil changes so you cannot find a cheaper way to drive hundred and fifty thousand miles period it can't be done 
All right, that's it for today's episode. I'll include links to the Economy Visa of the Week in the video description. Thank you guys for tuning in, and I'll see you next time.